Okay, well, uh, first of all, thank you very much to uh, both FC and the Naval Institute for asking me to uh, kind of conduct a keynote. And what I'm going to try and do is take about 30 minutes and just kind of walk us around the world a little bit, which has changed a great deal, even in the year since we gathered uh, back in 2016 here in this beautiful city of San Diego. And I thought I would begin uh, by looking around the 21st century world, but I want to begin by pointing out that it's about 100 years since the Battle of Jutland. So we're edging up toward that uh, august anniversary in which um, about 10,000 people died and uh, probably 200,000 tons of shipping were destroyed. Um, it, it ought to help us remember that despite all the turmoil we face today, um, if you go back 100 years to that very violent 20th century, you see the Battle of Jutland, or these are graves from Verdun, which was located just a few miles from my headquarters when I was the Supreme Allied Commander at NATO. Uh, in the Battle of Verdun, which ended in 2016, um, we saw probably a million casualties. Um, and earlier in that year, we'd seen the Battle of Jutland, as I mentioned. So 2016, an incredibly bloody year. Um, World War I in total, hard to estimate, but probably 20 million dead. Did we learn anything? No. We moved right into the Second World War, essentially, with a brief stop at a global depression between. This is an iconic photograph from the Battle of Stalingrad, where the Russians finally take that city in a battle that has probably 2 million casualties. We wrap up the 20th, that part of the 20th century and move into a Cold War, divide the world and come close to destroying it in a nuclear apocalypse in the early 1960s. So yes, we have challenges today. It's a difficult world. Um, there are many ways we can misstep and combat and difficulty can overtake us, but I do not predict uh, the kind of global cataclysmic series of events that we saw uh, 100 years ago and then on into the 20th century. Instead, we have kind of a different set of challenges that we face today, uh, one of which is uh, violent extremism, which certainly includes elements of uh, radical Islam. This, of course, is the Pentagon and 9-11. Uh, the little red circle you see there was my office. I had a front row seat, unfortunately. Uh, on that day, and it it caused me to understand that um, this kind of violent extremism, some of which indeed comes out of radical elements in Islam, this is a young Islamic State fighter who's being commended for just having executed his mother in the town square of Raqqa. This kind of violent extremism is part of the backdrop of the 21st century, and you know, we tend to think of it as occurring in Iraq and Syria and Afghanistan, places far, far away and places that are uh, predominantly Muslim. But how about a little closer to home? This is Europe, a small, peaceful country, Norway. That handsome young man, upper right, is named Anders Breivik. Several summers ago, he blows up the government house. This would be like blowing up the old executive office building. And then he kills seven doing that. Then he goes to a small island off the coast of uh, Oslo, and he kills 70 young Norwegians between the ages of 18 and 24. You see him upper left apologizing in court. He's apologizing to the forces of right-wing nationalism in Europe for not having killed more people on that day. So this violent extremism is, is absolutely not confined to radical jihadists emanating from Islam. Um, there are political violent extremists, and here in the United States, we have uh, all of these plus uh, racial extremists. This is Dylan Roof, who was just uh, sentenced to death, deservedly in my view, in South Carolina for having killed execution style a small prayer gathering at a historic African-American church. So this kind of violent extremism runs across societies, geographies, and motivations. But we ought to focus at the moment, I think, uh, on the Islamic State. They're kind of terrorism, uh, 
2.0, if you think of uh, Al Qaeda as 1.0, or maybe they're 3.0, if you want to reach back to the uh, some of the earlier terrorist groups. But they're extraordinary at raising money and are beginning to demonstrate real global reach. Uh, about a year ago, in change, they blew up a Russian airliner full of uh, innocent vacation goers flying home from Sharm el Sheikh, Egypt, back to Russia. Last Christmas, Christmas before last, I should say, they uh, conducted horrific attacks in Paris uh, right around Christmas. Same time, same casualty level, they blew up a marketplace in uh, Lebanon. Here in the United States, we've seen manifestations in California, San Bernardino. Uh, Turkey continues to be uh, overrun with Islamic State incidents. Most recently here in the United States at the Pulse nightclub down in Orlando, uh, we had 50 plus young Americans killed. So this group is, of all the violent extremist organizations out there, the most dangerous. We're closing in on them slowly and painfully. I think we'll clear out Mosul over the next three to six months, uh, but they will continue and they have a plan. This is their idea of global order. This is the caliphate. Now look at Andalus, look at Spain. I don't think it's gonna actually be called Andalus anytime soon, but when an organization is this dangerous and has so much apparent global reach and has a plan, we ought to be very concerned about them. So that's one element of the 21st century security challenge that we need to face. Another is a, a series of national challenges. Um, and I'd put at the top of the list um, Iran, uh, merely because while we have managed to create uh, a nuclear agreement that I hope will prevent them from obtaining a nuclear weapon, Secretary Kerry uh, work diligently to negotiate it. The bad news is, even without nuclear weapons, this is how Iran sees itself. That's the Iranian flag in the upper right, current Iranian flag. The two flags to the left are the battle flags of Darius the Magnificent and Cyrus the Magnificent, two of the Persian emperors who ruled uh, Persia, today's Iran, and you see the extent of it about 2,500 years ago. It dominated uh, much of the ancient world for uh, centuries. So whether or not the Iranians have a nuclear weapon, they certainly see themselves as an imperial power. And they'll continue to create challenges as they are today in uh, Yemen, in Lebanon, uh, against Israel through their surrogate, Hezbollah, uh, in Damascus, and in Beirut. And the real challenge in the Middle East today is this kind of uh, war that's developing between two blocks. One is Shia Iran, and the other is Sunni Saudi Arabia and the Sunni states that line up uh, with the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. That's the Saudi flag in the lower left. Of course, right in the middle of all of this is our strongest ally in the region, Israel. So. In addition to that violent extremism we talked about a moment ago, I think we're gonna to continue to see real challenges from Iran. But many people would say Iran is not the most dangerous nation in the world. It's actually North Korea. Why? Because leadership matters and North Korea is led by a young, undisciplined, unpredictable, um, untested, individual named Kim Jong-un. He's well named because he is so unpredictable. He is not irrational and we can in many ways understand the trajectory of his behavior, but he's already got nuclear weapons and increasingly he's developing the ability to deliver them at range. So we really need to, as we think about nations that endanger us, uh, certainly North Korea would be among them. Close to Europe, we need to worry about Syria, where the dictator Assad, one of the greatest human rights violators of the 21st century, with probably 500,000 deaths in the Syrian civil war to his, uh, I don't want to say credit, on his ledger, um, and has pushed 7 million Syrians out of the country on a pre-war population of 21 million, 
with 7 million more displaced internally. All of that leads to this, waves of refugees that are coming from um, Syria and the Levant and, and now with pressure coming across Libya and it's destabilizing our greatest pool of allies in the world, our friends in Europe. So Iran, North Korea, and Syria, I think, are three uh, smaller nations that are going to present challenges for us. Is there a big nation in the mix? Unfortunately, there is, and it's Russia, where we've seen their behavior over the last two, three years include invasion of Ukraine and annexing the Crimean Peninsula. Now, I'm showing you a map here, which is a, a pretty benign way to think of Ukraine. Here's what it looks like today in Ukraine. It's a war. People are dying every day. There's a failed peace agreement called the Minsk Accord, which is not uh, holding in place. And our fundamental error is that we tend to think of the strategic terrain as being what I showed you on that map. That's not the strategic terrain in Ukraine. The strategic terrain is right here. It's in the mind of Vladimir Putin. We have failed to move him to a strategic position where he sees advantage in working coherently with the West, with NATO, and with the United States. And as a result, this is what we're going to see, more hybrid warfare, so-called little green men, unmarked soldiers, uh, cyber, use of social networks for propaganda, uh, use of insurgent techniques. He will continue to use this kind of uh, action against um, both nations around his periphery and possibly against NATO nations. So NATO is looking very hard at hybrid warfare. A couple of months ago in proceedings, I wrote an article about the coming age of hybrid warfare at sea, which I think will see practice not only by Russia, but probably by China in the South China Sea at some point as well. So there are some nations I'm concerned about. We should also be concerned about the movement of narcotics around the world, both uh, opium, heroin, which you see here, as well as uh, cocaine in the Americas. Uh, this is a mission that our Coast Guard, our Customs and Border Patrol team with us on. And that kind of global movement of narcotics and global criminal activity, I think, is part of this 21st century landscape. What else should we be concerned about? We had to think about what's going on in Asia. I often recommend this book by my friend Robert Kaplan, Asia's Cauldron, kind of walks around the South China Sea, looks at the challenges there. China's rising as a military power. These are Chinese submarines. I think we can avoid the so-called Thucydides trap where we would fall into a conflict with China because they're a rising power and the United States is an established power. Let's hope we can avoid that, uh, but it'll require skillful diplomacy. So we need to be cautious about China, uh, but not overthink uh, the specific threat. What we may see is a series of sharp, aggressive actions uh, in the South China Sea, of course. We also ought to worry about the high north as the uh, polar ice caps melt. And we ought to worry about uh, Mother Nature and what she can do to us. This is Ebola at the top and Zika virus at the bottom. Um, every hundred years in human history, there tends to be a pandemic. And despite the fact that the human race has improved considerably medically over that previous hundred years, we seem to get caught every time. About a hundred years ago, 1918, Spanish influenza infected 40% of the world's population with a 20% mortality rate. We're due for another pandemic. So that's, you know, that's quite a basket of challenges I've put up there. I'll tell you, when I was a NATO commander, people would ask me sometimes, well, what, what really keeps you awake at night, Admiral? What, what really worries you the most? Is it Afghanistan or Syria or piracy or terrorism or the Balkans? What worries you the most? And the answer is, all the things I've talked about worry me, but we're reasonably well prepared to respond to them. What worries me the most is this. It's cyber. These are the flags of uh, Ukraine, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, and the Republic of Georgia. 
what they have in common, in addition to being relatively small to medium-sized democracies in the Eurasian continent, what else they have in common is that all of them have undergone a cyber attack at some time in the last few years. And um, cyber is not only uh, big nations attacking small nations like this, cyber, because of the ability particularly to go after the electric grid, can be small nations attacking big nations. Uh, a couple of years ago, the North Korean dictator, Kim Jong-un, was quite angered by this rather bad movie called The Interview. It was a satire about him and about North Korea, kind of a harmless piece of fluff. He didn't look at it that way, and as a result, he unleashed his cyber forces, that's the flag of North Korea, against Sony Pictures, an American corporation, and did tens of millions of dollars of kinetic damage against Sony. So this cyber challenge, I think, is very, very dangerous because we're relatively unprepared to all the other things I've talked about. So as I wrap up challenges, let me give you just two geopolitical ones to be concerned about. One is the way Europe is kind of pulling apart. A Brexit, the Great Britain coming out of the European Union is a, is a serious blow to European unity, and European unity is a core U.S. interest. At the same time, the continuing challenge of the euro, that's the symbol for the euro there, uh, feels like the myth of Sisyphus, and I'm Greek-American, so I'm allowed to use Greek myths when I talk. The Europeans just continue to push the boulder of the euro up the hill, but it seems to always roll back down upon them. So our greatest pool of partners have real challenges. And then a second geopolitical situation is right here in the United States, where I think we're headed toward more gridlock. Um, we have a new administration that's trying to get its footing um, diametrically opposed. Um, we already have a president whose approval ratings are quite low. That normal bounce of unity that our nation tends to get after a presidential election just hasn't happened. And as a result of everything, there's this kind of sense that the world is too complicated. Maybe we ought to just come home, go behind walls, and uh, find our way back here. Will not work. So right about now, you ought to be saying, gosh, Admiral, that's quite a basket of challenges and dangerous patches of water out ahead of us. You know, what do you, what do you think? What, what can we do about it? Are there any opportunities out there? that we can marshal as we try and create security for our nation. Well, I'll give you several. Now, you think the next photograph is going to be like a U.S. aircraft carrier coming straight at you. That's our, our path to security. Well, that's part of it. But I would argue the most important tool we have is this. It's listening. Listening to each other within our own country so we can overcome all of this gridlock and anger. Let's have serious policy debates, uh, but let's begin by listening to each other. We can listen to our allies and our friends and understand their position and what they can bring to the mix for us. We ought to be listening very carefully to the Europeans right now, for example, who are in a bit of disarray because of finances and because of the Brexit. We ought to be listening closely to our friends and allies. And then thirdly, yes, we should listen to our opponents as well. We have to keep these lines of dialogue open. In the case of Russia, for example, we can't afford to go stumbling backward into another Cold War. That serves nobody's interest. So I would argue at the top of my list for where we could do more and do better, it would be listening more. What else? Many of you in the audience, I hope, would recognize this beautiful place, not so far from Boston, uh, where I am currently uh, conducting this talk on VTC. This is the Naval War College, Newport, Rhode Island. I put it here to remind us that a second important thing we can do is exactly what you're doing right now. Pause, reflect, listen, build intellectual capital. Um, that happens at the War College in short courses, 
medium length executive education, year long courses where we send our very best officers and senior enlisted. Um, this idea of reading, thinking, listening, speaking, publishing, all of those things happen at a place like this and they happen at conferences like this that the Naval Institute and FC are putting on and they're important. What else can we do? I would argue this is pretty important. This is our values. Democracy, liberty, freedom of speech, freedom of expression, a free press, gender equality, racial equality. We've evolved these values over the last 2,000 years from the ancient Greeks through the Romans, that's Cicero at the top, through the Enlightenment in Europe, that's the young Voltaire, through our founding fathers here in Europe, George Washington needs no introduction, to someone like Angela Merkel, the Chancellor of Germany, one of the most principled leaders in the world today. We cannot let go of our values. I think that's a crucial part of our security as well. We should also spend a little more time, I would argue, as Americans learning languages. To know another language is to truly and deeply know and appreciate another culture. That's the Rosetta Stone on the left. On the right is a young Canadian corporal who's teaching himself Pashto on a deployment to Afghanistan. That kind of investment in language is an important component for creating real security. What else can we do? We can read. We can learn through books. Um, H.R. McMaster, the brand new national security advisor, wrote a terrific book when he was a major uh, while obtaining his PhD at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. It's called Dereliction of Duty. At its heart, it's a book about speaking truth to power, something we're going to have to count on him to do as he takes up incredibly important duties in the White House. Black Flags, you want to understand where ISIS came from? This book won the Pulitzer Prize for the journalist Joe B. Warwick. Bottom right, a classic of our profession in the sea services, the rules of the game about the Battle of Jutland back in 1916, or that great classic, Thucydides, study of the Peloponnesian Wars, about the tension between land power and sea power, about coalitions and how you build them. Or even if you can't invest in reading a book, I challenge you to read The Economist every week cover to cover. You know, I was the Supreme Allied Commander for four years. I saw the same intelligence, essentially, the president did every day. 90% of what I learned in my intelligence briefing, maybe 95%, you can get out of reading The Economist every week. It's a terrific one-stop shopping to stay tuned in on the world. Being part of that helps create real security. And of course, it's not just nonfiction. There are incredible novels out there that help us become better leaders. Gates of Fire, Killer Angels, Ender's Game, I love a Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court. If I can uh, shamelessly mention a book that I have coming out with the Naval Institute in March, the Institute will release the Leader's Bookshelf, 50 books that make you a better leader. My point is all of these come together to increase the ability for all of us to be part of creating security. What other opportunities are there? I would argue our nation remains a powerful opportunity in the world. Upper left, regardless of how you feel about our current president or our previous president, that is President Obama there at the G20, the 20 largest economies in the world. Look what happens when the president of the United States speaks. Every other head on the global stage turns. That's a powerful responsibility for our president but it shows you the political capital the United States has and still has today. Upper right, our economy. It's far from perfect. We have big problems with debt and deficit, but I would argue our hand of cards overall economically probably better than any other major economy. Lower right, we have a powerful, capable, apolitical military Bottom left, we're a young nation. Demographics help us, and immigration helps us. Many nations are going to suffer over the next half century 
as their populations age. China, Japan, the Balkans, the Baltics, Italy, many others will face that challenge. We will not because we're young and because people want to come here. Should we control our borders? Of course. Can we do that and still encourage immigration? I think we can. And what's that in the center? That's a fracking tower. If we get the environmental piece of fracking right, we have every chance of attaining energy independence. Now, there are big questions that had to do with the market for natural gas and a thousand other things. But when you put that whole package together, we remain a very capable nation. The really interesting question is, who are our best partners? And I'm going to show you one that may surprise you, because the obvious ones are NATO and Europe or Japan, Australia, New Zealand. We have many traditional partners. I'd say India is where we ought to look, uh, in addition to our traditional partners. Massive nation. It'll overtake China by mid-century in population. A young nation still, uh, very dynamic. Does it have challenges and problems with corruption and internecine conflict? Absolutely. This is the golden temple of Amritsar, sacred to the Sikh faith. India has many challenges, but they are a massive democracy. Over the course of this century, I would argue, the rise of India will be more important than the rise of China. And yes, we should very much treasure our traditional alliances, those nations with whom we are pledged to defend with our blood and our treasure, 28 NATO nations, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, Thailand, the Philippines. These are treaty allies of the United States. But I would argue in today's world, you'll see more security generated in coalitions. This is the combined joint task force against the Islamic State. And as you can see, it has many traditional U.S. allies depicted, but also some of our Arab partners, some non-traditional partners. These kind of coalitions will be crucial. What else do we need for real security? Wait for it. Yep, we do need a powerful global military force. We do need those aircraft carriers. We do need our submarines. We need ballistic missile systems. Look closely at that ship, by the way. It's not a U.S. ship. Um, this is one of our alliance partners who are developing ballistic missile technology. We need a global maritime coalition that includes Marines and Coast Guard, a strong merchant marine, all of that fits together in creating real security for us. I would argue, and this conference will really unpackage a lot of this, you're going to see some changes to that traditional force, which I would argue for the Navy, for example, ought to be around 340 ships. But you're going to need better cyber capability, as in Ender's Game, a, a novel about a cyber force. We're going to need better unmanned platforms, including those operating in the maritime space and in the overhead. And we're going to need peerless special forces. This is, of course, Michael Murphy. Many of you may have seen the film Lone Survivor or read the book by Marcus Luttrell. This is an extraordinary young officer who died in Afghanistan where he received the Medal of Honor for a an incredible mission he performed there. Uh, today, he's memorialized in the destroyer USS Michael Murphy. I put him here not only to make the point that we need peerless special forces like Michael Murphy, a Navy SEAL, but also he stands today and represents, in my mind, all of the wonderful volunteers in the sea services as well as the Army and the Air Force. Um, these are the young men and women who stand on the wall at night and protect us volunteers all. They will be crucial to our security. Just to wrap up, some other things we can do for security. I think more of this kind of soft power. Certainly we need hard power. We're not going to negotiate a solution with the Islamic State, but we can supplement it and encourage it and create other forms of security by the work of our hospital ships or through literacy training in Afghanistan. We're using the social networks 
This is the world according to Facebook. The brighter the white, the higher the concentration of Facebook users. Moving our messages in these social networks, pushing back against the jihadists, for example, or the right-wing crazies that are out there, that will be crucial. So we're almost at the end, and then I'll be happy to take some uh, comments and questions. Um, you know you weren't going to get out of this room alive without a good SWO shot. This, uh, of course, is a, a wonderful uh, Aegis ship launching. And I put it here because I've spoken a lot today about what might be termed soft power, uh, listening more, uh, education, our values, learning languages, reading books, studying leadership, uh, soft power kinds of tools. I believe in those. But I wouldn't want anyone to leave here today or after this conference with the slightest doubt that we need this. We need hard power. We have to be able, as the law requires us, to conduct prompt and sustained combat operations at sea. I'm quite confident the sea services can and will continue to do that. So to find that balance between hard and soft power, I think, is the trick. Knowing when you need hard power, when you go after thugs, killers, torturers, rapists, like the Islamic State. But when do you need soft power? You need them both. And it's a rheostat. You have to kind of dial them in. So as I conclude, again, my apologies for not being with you today. I will be at the conference uh, by midweek. I look forward to uh, moderating a panel with the uh, three leaders of the three USC services. I commend and thank the U.S. Naval Institute and AFSEA. And with that, I will open it up for some questions and comments and thank all of you for being part of this conference and thank the many veterans and active duty in the room for your service to our nation. Thank you very much. Sir Pete Daly, good morning. Uh, thank you for the, your remarks. I'm going to do an icebreaker question and just ask you, I know you've just gotten off the plane from Munich, and I'd like to get your read on the mood there and how some of the very points that you've made are playing right now uh, in Europe. Yeah, thanks, Pete. And um, for those who, who want to do a deep dive on that question, if you Google Time Magazine and Stavridis, you'll pop up the... Uh, the article that I, I wrote for Time, which is online and will be in the print edition uh, later this week. Uh, in a nutshell, the Europeans are very nervous by what they see as inconsistencies in U.S. foreign policy. Um, looking globally, they see a U.S. that uh, seems to be walking away from the two-state solution and, uh, correction, seems to be walking away, yes, yeah, seems to be walking away from the two-state solution toward a one-state solution in Palestine, but now maybe we're back to a two-state solution. In China, we kind of flirt with walking away from the one-China policy, which is uh, explosive in the eyes of the Chinese. On, uh, on Europe, uh, there's particular concern about Russia. We see a UN ambassador, Nikki Haley, who makes a very good and a very tough statement about Russian invasion of uh, Ukraine and annexation of Crimea, but we continue to see a kind of a flirting with Vladimir Putin out of the White House. Um, we see the president calling NATO obsolete, uh, but then we see Secretary Mattis and Vice Pe President Pence talking in very laudatory terms about the alliance. So all of this, Pete, makes the Europeans nervous because uh, like, like any actor in the global system, what they crave is consistency and predictability. So the question is, the interesting question is, what should we do? Uh, first of all, let's give the administration some space. They're 30 days into this thing. Um, they have a new team on board. It's going to take some time to get the gears meshing. I, I am skeptical when I hear the president say that the White House is running like a well-oiled machine. That's pretty hard to uh, accept on face value. Uh, but let's give them some space to put some oil in the machine, and maybe it'll start running better. Uh, the good news is absolutely terrific first-class national security team now that 
General Flynn has been dismissed and H.R. McMaster, General H.R. McMaster has taken over. So to have Jim Mattis, John Kelly, Rex Tillerson, and now H.R. McMaster, hey, that's the A-team. Everybody knows the first three. H.R. McMaster, three-star Army general, worked for me in Afghanistan, brilliant, creative, also a very steady planner and thinker. Uh, he's the complete package, and he wrote a book, Dereliction of Duty, specifically about the need to speak truth to power. I, I think he's going to have a chance to put that one into practice. So a very good team in place. What should they do? Uh, I think they need to lay out a handful of core principles we want to pursue, uh, strength with NATO. We want to be accepting of a one-China policy. We want a two-state solution in Palestine. We want to build our relationships in Latin America and the Caribbean, et cetera. We need, you know, the basic framework of a global strategy. That's way before you really write the sophisticated one. But let's get a, a basic policy framework out there. And that'll be General McMaster's job one as he takes over the NSC. Uh, secondly, I think the team needs to be filled out at the second and third tier level ASAP, like yesterday. Uh, to, at this stage, not to have deputies at state and defense and AID and uh, any number of other agencies is, is starting to be very concerning. Uh, number three, I'd say figure out what the likely first challenges are and rehearse them, practice them, war game them. Look, we know North Korea is going to continue to challenge. We know that Putin is going to buzz more of our ships out at sea. Sooner or later, we're going to shoot one of those down. Uh, or one of them is going to hit an American destroyer. We know China is going to push on us in the South China Sea. You can see all those things coming. We ought to be rehearsing our responses to uh, each of them. And uh, fourth, I would say we need to uh, reach out to our allies and our friends and try and construct a global approach that really takes into account uh, that we are so much stronger and so much smarter as all of us than we are as a, a single nation acting unilaterally. Um, I'll stop there. There's more I could say about it, but I think, Pete, that's the general outline. Okay, we've got time for one more quick question before we let Admiral go. Good morning, Admiral. Jay Rindler, San Diego Navy League. Can you share with us a story when, like when you were with NATO, when, uh, how you would deal with uh, your counterpart on an entrenched issue that they're just not going to budge on, sir? I can. What a terrific question. Thank you. Um, you know, the one I'll um, pick is actually not a NATO colleague, but while I was the NATO commander, I met uh, several times with the head of the Russian Armed Forces, uh, General Nikolai Makarov. And, uh, well, it, it kind of helped because, as, as many of you will know, I'm not exactly a towering Brad Pitt-like figure. I'm like five foot, five inches tall on a really good day when I stand up extra straight. Um, and the good news is General Makarov is like exactly my height. So um, I mentioned that kind of tongue in cheek, but part of diplomacy, part of overcoming um, challenges is to focus on human connections. And the first thing I said to General Makarov was, well, I know we are really going to see things eye to eye, General Makarov. And, you know, being a famous fellow short guy, you know, he laughed and I laughed. Um, those kind of small things really matter. Um, secondly, if you have a huge disagreement, step back from it and try and find smaller zones of cooperation. At that time, we had a significant dif disagreement with the Russian Federation about the fact that we were putting a ballistic missile defense system in Eastern Europe. And it was directed against Iran, and it's still directed against Iran. But our Russian colleagues were concerned that it might have the capability to shoot down their intercontinental ballistic missiles, which would have been highly destabilizing. So that was a big disagreement. But rather than dive right into that, I kind of stepped back and, and I said to General Makarov, hey, I'm an admiral, let's talk about piracy. Uh, as you may recall, back around 2010, 2011, we had a very significant piracy problem off the coast of East Africa. 
We had a pretty good NATO mission out there. Uh, we had a good EU, European Union mission. But I said to General Makarov, hey, we should all be against pirates. Let's see if we can get Russia involved in counter piracy. And he said, well, you know, it's hard because we don't have good communications and how can we establish connectivity? I said, let's have our staffs work on that. And they did, and over time, we emplaced a communication system. Um, without going into great depth on this, it was a good example of picking a smaller zone where you can find cooperation with someone with whom you have big disagreements. And I would argue another aspect of that was Afghanistan, where Russian and U.S. interests and NATO interests actually align. The Russians have zero interest in a destabilized Afghanistan. Um, so that was another zone of cooperation we could find to try and work. So third and final thing, try and consciously put yourself in the shoes of the other person. So again, back to Russia, I tried hard to really understand technically why Russia was so adamantly opposed to this missile system. And it required a lot of technical study um, and eventually I, I came to really understand their concerns. I think as you looked at them, the balance of the argument was still on our side of the issue uh, because of the speed of their intercontinental ballistic missiles and the placement and the timing. But I, I came to really understand why they were so concerned about it. And when we did dive into the actual discussion about the missile system, I was so much better prepared for the conversation because I had consciously put myself in the shoes of the other. And that's probably a pretty good place to close. If there is one thing we should all do, both as leaders of our organizations, in our families, at home, and as nations in the international system, we should very consciously put ourselves in the shoes of the other. Um, doesn't mean you're going to always agree, doesn't mean you're not going to end up uh, having to pull out a hard power tool at some point, but it increases the chances immensely that we can find our way to solutions that create real security in the 21st century. Thank you very much. I look forward to seeing everybody midweek as the conference unfolds. Thank you, and thank you very much, General Shea, for that kind introduction. Admiral, if you were